Like everyone else, you were born into bondage. Born into a prison. For your mind. Buckle your seatbelt, Dorothy. Because Kansas is going bye-bye. You'll want to remember this moment as the last time you thought the flat earth was stupid. Hello everyone, this is ODD, and yes, I'm finally admitting that even though I don't like labels, I'm a flat earther. Based on my research for the past 10 months, our world is very different from the model that we are being taught by the authority on the matter. It took me a while to come to terms with this, and it took even longer to gain the courage to talk about it. It can be pretty embarrassing to go against popular opinion, but this is real. It's not a psyop, it's not a distraction, and it's not a bandwagon. It's a reasonable debate. It's thousands of people taking what we've been told and comparing it to what we see and experience, only to find out that they do not match up. Once you start digging into this, it becomes clear that there is no evidence for the speculated spinning ball that we supposedly live on, and everything points to a flat earth. The Flat Earth is much more than just reasonable. The one and only reason that it's reasonable to argue against the Flat Earth is that we've all been taught otherwise our whole lives. We blindly believe something that A. has never been proven, and B. is pretty much impossible. Thanks to people like Eric Dubay, the Flat Earth has re-emerged and it has more steam than ever. Before I've ever even entertained the Flat Earth, I knew not to trust the space programs of the world. Close examinations of NASA and other space programs reveal that things aren't what they seem and that we, the people, are being lied to. We have no real pictures of the Earth, and no matter how hard we try, we just can't find the curvature. Not only that, but flight paths make more sense on a flat map, and large bodies of water not being able to curve into a giant ball completely resonates. Forensically speaking, the globe model is so very unlikely that any good detective wouldn't believe a f**k-off word the globe says. The globe's story is so full of circumstantial, impossible coincidences, which only prove that the globe is a f**king fire. We'll be going over that in this video as well as other reasons why the world isn't what we're led to believe. I appreciate you tuning in. Let's get started. Our daily observations of the Earth are consistent with a flat and stationary surface. Most if not all ancient civilizations knew that the Earth was flat. The people of today would say that ancient cultures were ignorant and unaware, yet they accomplished great feats that we still can't accomplish to this day. The truth is that they had real knowledge, and some of us only have an education. But what is an education? Education is when you are told what to think and how to think. Those that are able to remember and regurgitate what they've been told on command are considered well-educated, but there is a big difference between being educated and being intelligent. Just because you believe what you've been told doesn't make it true. In fact, the flat versus spherical earth is a debate that has never really died. It's been raging for centuries. It was a huge argument as recently as the early and mid-1900s, but with programs like NASA, founded in 1958, the latter half of the 20th century was a win for the spherical Earth. It wasn't a question for the average person anymore. Though at the time the shape of the Earth was still up to be proven, NASA claims that they went to the moon and captured a shot of the spherical Earth as if they always knew it was indeed spherical. Those of you who think this technical difficulty was planned and think I'm scamming you, go do it for yourself. Because <laughs> you're going to find the exact same thing. i got nothing to hide here. This is live on the air, okay? I'm going to zoom in on the Earth in Photoshop. Can you see the Earth? To image, adjust, levels. And I'm going to bring the levels over here. And I'm going to bring the levels up. Uh-oh. What is that? Why is there a square box around the Earth allegedly taken from the scientists on the moon in Apollo 17? And people wonder why I don't trust NASA. That's why I don't trust NASA. I mean, they're always out there saying, you know, Rob, you, everybody's trying to show you stuff from space and you, won't, you keep rejecting it. This is why I reject it. These guys are liars. 
you know? What are some of the basic observations someone can make to ascertain that the Earth is neither a globe or spinning? We've been taught that we're on a ball spinning around the sun. And so to hear that you might be on a flat plane, uh, motionless at the center of the universe with all the celestial bodies spinning around you, just as it appears, actually comes as a surprise. But it shouldn't, because our eyes, experience, and common sense all tell us that the horizon is perfectly flat, and we feel motionless. We don't hear ourselves whizzing by at thousands of miles per hour. No matter how high amateur rockets or balloons have gone up, the horizon rises to the eye of the observer all the way up, and that's only consistent with a flat plane. Their theory just gets more and more wild as time has gone on. And so, yeah, it began with the spinning Earth going a thousand miles per hour, which is then circling around the sun at 67,000 miles per hour, which then they decided the sun was, it wasn't a heliocentric model, but more of an eccentric model, where they don't know where the center is and we're just exploding out of a big bang. So the, uh, the sun, uh, we're, we're spinning around the sun and then the sun and us are spinning around the Milky Way galaxy, they say, at 500,000 miles per hour. And then the entire Milky Way galaxy, they say, is shooting off from the Big Bang at 670 million miles per hour, almost the speed of light. Uh, so there's at least four uh, rip-raging, contradictory motions supposedly going at all times, yet you don't experience uh, any of it, nor can you measure any of it using the stars. The flat motionless Earth is, not only is it the greatest conspiracy of all, it's also the easiest to prove. I mean, it, it just is flat and motionless, just as it appears. Look into it more and more, make it, make it a, a thing to try and debunk it, if you will. You know, even if you want to do it that way. Negative reinforcement works too. Try as you will, you're only going to find proofs for the flat motionless Earth you're not going to confirm that you're on a spinning ball. The curvature of the Earth eludes us. Either the Earth is much larger in circumference than we are told, or the curve just doesn't exist. People assume that there is a curve, but it's never really been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Cameras with fisheye lenses, Hollywood movies, and NASA CGI are the closest we get to seeing curvature. The deception and the lies are just so pervasive and they're just so deep that I, I swear it gives me a headache. The surface of water is always level. This is just natural physics. We know this, that water, uh, if unobstructed and uncontained, will flow outwards, uh, finding it the easiest course to maintain its own level, right? So, uh, but the ball earth model claims that the oceans are huge, 100 mile walls of curved water curving around the ball. That's ridiculous. They say that gravity makes it this possible, but you don't see that. You go right. to the beach, you see a completely flat horizon, you see water just ever so gently uh, coming up on the shore. So there's the pretty blue marble that NASA claims we are living on with circumference of 24,901 and 3959 radius. So to find the curvature, you take eight inches times your distance squared. That's eight inches times your distance squared. And if you don't square the distance, you end up with this. And this is not what NASA has shown us. They have given us a beautiful blue marble that we love. So, so you get 8 inches for 1 mile, 32 inches in 2 miles, 16.6 .6 feet with 5 miles, so on and so forth. So what I did is I shot this pier, which is in Daytona Beach, Florida. And as you can see, between the water and the walkway of the pier is about 12 to 16 feet based on the height of the people and the railing. So I started at... Um, Granada, which is 4.92 miles away, and I shot this, and based on that distance and the formula, there should be 16 feet of curvature, but obviously you can still see the entire gap under the, um, the walkway there between that and the water. So in addition to that, behind that pier is actually a lighthouse, which you can see 
uh, right above the pier, you can see the light. That is 16 miles away from my location. And I shot that lighthouse. Now that lighthouse is 175 feet tall, and the curvature from 16 miles away should be 170 feet. You can clearly see about the entire lighthouse uh, beyond that pier. So like I said, there should be 170 feet of curvature, but there's none. And those hotels there are even further. Those are in New Smyrna, which is 20 miles away. If NASA is right, and there is, you know, we do live on a ball, they're gonna have to make up that curvature. If it's not in the 20 miles I'm shooting, well then that means it's gotta be made up further on down the line. So you can't have it both ways. You can't say we live on this ball and then say, oh, you can't detect the curvature. Well. You gotta detect it somewhere because if it's not dropping here, it's gonna have to drop even more down the lines in order to make that circle, that ball they say we live on. And it's pretty round. That blue marble they give us is perfectly round. Lighthouses are one great example. The Isle of Wight Lighthouse in England, it's 180 feet high and can be seen up to 42 miles away, a distance at which modern astronomers say the light should fall 996 feet below the line of sight. Why can you still see it? Another one worth mentioning that people be familiar with is the Statue of Liberty. It stands 326 feet above sea level, and on a clear day it can be seen as far as 60 miles away. Now if the Earth was a globe at the dimensions that they give us, that would put Lady Liberty at an impossible 2,074 feet below the horizon. No, not one picture of the Earth. Imagine that. 2016, and we still don't have a picture of our home. Thousands of satellites supposedly orbiting the Earth. Why can't we get thousands of pictures? One shot with the whole Earth in it. Hell, we should have a channel on cable that shows the Earth rotating 24 hours a day, every day. Nope. Let's listen to NASA's very own Robert Simmon talk about how we get our fake pictures of Earth. In 1972, we saw our home in a new way. Apollo 17 astronauts snapped this picture. It gave people the first look at their home planet as a single entity. Last week, scientists at NASA released this. The shot is compiled from data from NASA's VIRS instrument, which orbits the Earth about every hundred minutes, taking measurements of light coming off the planet. That can be translated into ribbons of imagery like this, and then into one of these. And this is just the latest in NASA's Earth from Space album, which may be one of the most mind-expanding collections of images in human history. And then in 2002, Blue Marble 2.0, NASA's Rob Simmon made this. Simmons' job is... It's primarily taking data and making pictures out of it. That's what this is. A composite of data sets from several different instruments translated into a picture. So we actually had to take clouds out. They stashed the clouds for later, went onto the ocean. That came from an instrument that measures phytoplankton in the sea. Where it was low, I colored it dark blue because they're low mostly in mid-oceans. And then where it was a little bit higher, it was like a little bit brighter green. Then add the clouds back in. There's a small problem with it because there's a very slight gap in between each orbit. So some of those are painted on. It is photoshopped, but it's it's has to be. Then? There was another layer to sort of simulate the atmosphere. And then there's this little bright spot. It's called the specular highlight. So it's the reflection of sunlight off of water. Those are the pieces, but you can't just slap them all together. It just didn't look realistic. It looks kind of flat, or the clouds are sort of too see-through. So I just take Command-Z a lot. There's artistry to creating the world. What I imagine it to be. Um, unfortunately, I'm not an astronaut. <laughs> I've never been to space. But I've looked at these images over and over again, trying to sort of get the essence of it. It is photoshopped, but it's it has to be. It is photoshopped, but it's it has to be. It is photoshopped, but it's it has to be. It is photoshopped, but it's it has to be. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm allergic to bullshit. Not having one authentic picture of the Earth alone is a huge red flag. Christoph, let me ask you, 
Why do you think that uh, Truman has never come close to discovering the true nature of his world until now? We accept the reality of the world with which we're presented. It's as simple as that. The flat earth model is a working model. It's by no means definitive due to the nature of this massive cover-up. For the past 500 years we've been completely buying into the Copernicus heliocentric model, but what we do know about the flat earth is based on the azimuthal equidistant map that seems to be working out. This map goes as far back as the year 1000 and possibly earlier now used as an official map by the U.S. Geological Survey and also as the official logo for the United Nations. Is this our real home being hidden from us in plain sight? I think it is. The first thing a lot of people say is, where is the edge? Well, look at this map where Antarctica is a 360 degree ice barrier that holds the water in. These ice walls are real and they stand 150 feet above the surface of the water. Then you need to understand that there is no independent access to Antarctica. Average people can only go there on a guided tour. It has no towns, no cities, and no permanent residences. What's past the 150 foot ice wall is anyone's guess. How far the ice extends, how it terminates, and what exists beyond it. The Antarctic Treaty, signed in 1959 by 12 nations and more later on, states that Antarctica is for peaceful purposes only, no military activities, just scientific research and government exploration. Expeditions by any party must be discussed in advance. It's the longest and most successful treaty between nations. The treaty also states that there are ships, stations, and equipment to ensure compliance of the treaty. Sounds like military activity to me. Anyway, so this azimuthal equidistant map appears to be correct for the most part. Over the centuries, there's been other maps that look pretty close to it as well. Let's look at an interesting story that was recently in the news that supports this flat map. A woman gave birth on a flight from Bali to Los Angeles, so the flight made an emergency landing in Alaska. Here's what it would look like on a globe. Now, here's what it would look like on a flat earth. Which one makes more sense? Exactly. A big issue I was having with the flat earth for the longest time was the sunrise and sunsets. I realized that it was a perspective issue. First, you must understand that the sun is not 93 million miles away. If it was, we would never see anything like this here. This is concentrated because it's closer. It's much more probable that the sun is only a few thousand miles away and that it's the same size as the moon. Once you comprehend this, all of the sudden, solar eclipses make sense. Holy fucking shit! Something that makes sense! Okay, so the sun is close, which gives it the ability to spotlight the area that it's over, and when it leaves your view, due to perspective, it takes the light with it. There is a generous amount of light where the sun is at, but since it's so close, it doesn't spread its light like it would if it were bigger and further. The sun circumnavigates the earth like a huge clockwork. Sometimes that takes a while to sink in. Alright, let's talk about the Coriolis effect. The Coriolis effect states that when a moving object leaves the ground, the earth continues to rotate meaning that when shooting a gun at a certain distance, the bullet would be a little off due to the Earth's rotation. If that's the case, then airplanes would have to account for the Coriolis effect, but they don't. This is only a few things that work better on a flat, motionless Earth. Do you need a hundred excuses as to why you're not feeling any motion or seeing any curvature? Are those excuses easier to believe? Or is it easier to use Occam's razor and go with what our senses are telling us? The Earth is flat and not spinning. Now, real quick, let's kind of just uh, explain the Coriolis effect in layman's terms. Uh, the Coriolis effect is the effect that when the bullet leaves the barrel of the gun, it is actually leaving the surface of the Earth. So as the bullet leaves the, the barrel of the gun, the Earth is still rotating. 
and the bullet is not rotating with the earth. So the earth will actually rotate out from underneath of the bullet while it is in flight. This one is a touchy subject. Uh, this whole fucking video is a touchy subject. So anyway, this one, this one's hard to get across to people big time. But outer space is up for debate. Space programs are compartmentalized and most astronauts are Freemasons that have to swear an oath of secrecy when dealing with the so-called missions. The thing is that there is so much footage of NASA and other space agencies making mistakes. Sometimes we could see bubbles in the spacewalks. Sometimes we could see harnesses and wires on the people in the International Space Station. The permed hair that moves nothing like it would in zero gravity. These are huge red flags. Not to mention the Van Allen radiation belt. The Van Allen radiation belt is a layer of energetic charged particles that is held in place around a magnetized planet such as Earth by the planet's magnetic field. Sounds kind of like a dome if there is one. Oddly enough, one of NASA's employees admitted that this radiation belt needs to be figured out before humans could pass through it. Listen closely. As we get further away from Earth, we'll pass through the Van Allen belts, an area of dangerous radiation. Radiation like this could harm the guidance systems, onboard computers, or other electronics on Orion. Naturally, we have to pass through this danger zone twice, once up and once back. But Orion has protection. Shielding will be put to the test as the vehicle cuts through the waves of radiation. Sensors aboard will record radiation levels for scientists to study. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. Let's talk about satellites. We've already discussed how there are no pictures of the Earth, so, are satellites even real? Not likely. Ground towers are built all over the world and are more than adequate to relay our television, radio, and cell phone service. All GPS is done through uh, land-based towers, and things like Google Earth are taken with high-altitude planes, and most of them are just done with cars on, on uh, street level. Did you know that satellites were actually invented by Arthur C. Clarke? the science fiction author. I didn't <laughs> they, know that. <laughs> they, they shortly became science fact uh, after that. They, yeah, the geostationary satellite, look it up. It was created by a science fiction author. And then within a decade, NASA claims to have sent a real one up there. And ever since then, that's where we get all our communications from. So if satellites were real, we would constantly hear stories of them being hit by meteors or comets, and that doesn't happen. Uh, no one's ever lost their direct TV feed during the Perseids meteor shower because one of the meteors knocked out one of the satellites. It doesn't happen, it's never happened, and it won't happen. And that to me tells me there is no satellites. You would constantly be worried about them and you would constantly hear about them having something happen. And it's so rare that you hear that. So you may or may not have heard the term cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is when new information challenges your beliefs and you just can't let go. It's just like that scene in The Matrix. No. 
I don't believe it. It's not possible. Stop. Let me out. Let me out. I want out. We have a rule. We never free a mind once it's reached a certain age. It's not easy going through this kind of deception and then realizing that your whole life was spent thinking and believing one thing when it's the opposite. Nobody wants to feel like they've been fooled, like they've been had. I'm a human just like you, and I never would have thought in my wildest dreams that I'd be on this kind of journey. This journey of realization and reckoning. This journey of putting everything I know to the side so I can absorb information that seems ridiculous, yet so sensible. It's time to say fuck it. It's not your fault that you were wrong. It's not your fault that you fell for a trick that the whole world also fell for. I'm right here with you. It's time to take down your mental barrier and recognize that we have a lot of work to do in order to find out what this place really is and why we're here. It's not to be slaves of the dollar. It's not to be slaves of the clock. Our reality is being manipulated and hidden from us. Please wake up and try to awaken those around you. So how did this happen? Okay, let's start in the classroom. The first time anybody enters a school classroom, they are introduced to the globe model of the Earth. This three-dimensional scale model of the Earth that has never been proven was invented in the 1400s. Fast forward to 1927, a big budget movie company called Universal Pictures came out with its movie intro and guess what? The spinning ball Earth still hasn't been proven. This is 30 years before NASA was founded. Over the years, Universal kept coming out with similar logo intros, and to this day, we see the spinning ball Earth before many of the movies that we watch. Besides, there are countless movies about outer space that use the same model. We have been indoctrinated, and it's as simple as that. For the spherical Earth to remain unproven after this long is a wake-up call to everybody that lives here. We need to shed this programming right here, right now, and find out what the fuck is going on. No more embracing this sick illusion that was created by psychopaths. I'm going to keep searching for answers and trying to make something happen. All I want to know is, who's coming with me? I like to be an explorer, like the Great Magellan. Oh, well, you're too late. There's really nothing left to explore. For your surgery, I asked if you had packed your cell phone, and you said, which one? When? Skylar, I was medicated. I mean, I, I, I could have said the world was flat. You know what I think? I think you accidentally told the truth. The world was flat. You know what I think? You accidentally told the truth. The world was flat. You know what I think? You
really the evidence shows me that it's flat and stationary. There is much more evidence uh, based on uh, uh, just pure analysis that it's flat and stationary. So it's not actually a sphere, it's an it's oblate. And officially it's an oblate spheroid. That's what we call it. But not only that, it's slightly wider below the equator than above the equator. A little chubbier. A little chubbier. Yeah. Chubby's a good way. It's like pear shaped. Yeah. Really, we're in big trouble as far as lack of critical thinking and lack of free thinking. We are really are in big, big trouble. We need to step it up as far as the awakening goes. You really need to put your thinking cap on and you really start to really need to start to look at these things and look at them with a critical eye and with a critical mind. Fifteen hundred years ago, everybody knew the Earth was the center of the universe. Five hundred years ago, everybody knew the Earth was flat. Hey there, Flat Earth researchers and debaters. This is ODD, and this is a follow-up to my video entitled True World, which is a 30-minute rundown of the Flat Earth phenomenon. The response to that video is incredible. I can't even keep up with the comments. Every other second I hear, Dude, look at the moon. That proves we're on a sphere. My dad is an airline pilot. This theory is garbage. You know what I mean? Some arguments don't even make sense. It's like, I ate a chicken pot pie last night for dinner. How does that work on the flat earth? Huh? Huh? I can relate when people are wondering how the sun works and what's the benefit of hiding this from us, but to say that Earth must be a sphere because other things look like they might be spheres is foolish. There is Earth, what we are on, teeming with life and providing us with what we need to be able to sustain or destroy. To build civilizations on a vast flat surface where large bodies of water are incapable of curving. Earth, where curvature and motion cannot be detected. And then there's other celestial bodies that aren't teeming with life, and we really don't know what they are or what they look like up close. Science batters itself impotently against the barriers of the unknown. All we get is CGI from NASA and friends. The spherical Earth paradigm is coming to an end. But was this meant to happen, or are we really unveiling something that was to remain hidden? Are we getting the full picture, or is this just the tip of the iceberg? Either way, I'm dedicated to this journey, and I'm honored to live in such an exciting time. Let's keep tearing NASA apart, including all the other space programs. It's one of the main keys in understanding the Flat Earth. Once someone sees how much deception is interwoven throughout these agencies, it's easier to grasp this grand conspiracy and how it was achieved. As always, we'll be going over that and much more in this video. I appreciate you tuning in. Let's get started. Where is the curvature? Where? Where? Where's the curvature? Where? Where? <laughs> I still haven't been able to find any curvature since I put out my last video, and believe me, I've been looking. 
Ever since I came out as a flat earther, I've been examining things much more closely. It's as if I'm secretly hoping to find something that will lay this flat earth to rest, so I can get back to my normal life of exposing chemtrails and secret societies. It's just not happening. The more I look, the more I'm convinced, and the more I want to talk about it. There is no curve to be found or measured. And there's hints sprinkled all over the place, like this popular study for instance. A study conducted by Department of Geography Texas State University and Department of Geography Arizona State University concludes that the state of Kansas is flatter than a pancake. On a scale where 1.0 means perfect flatness, the calculated flatness of the pancake is approximately 0.957. That's pretty flat, but Kansas is 0.9997 flat over its length of 400 miles, a distance that should render 20 miles of curvature from one side to the other on a sphere that's 25,000 miles in circumference. And I've seen plenty of stuff at between 100,000 and 130,000 feet that's flat as a pancake. No matter where you are above the surface of the Earth, the horizon always rises to your eye level. Doesn't matter if you're standing on a beach, or up a hill, or in a plane at 35,000 feet, the horizon is always at eye level. We know intuitively if we stand on a beach with a panoramic view, that the sea is flat. It's flat at sea level, it's flat from the top of Mount Everest, it's flat from over 20 miles high. In my efforts to try to prove the globe, it's, it's falling apart uh, with horizon tests uh, and seeing things that we shouldn't be able to see. If the ball is real, the math shows that you know, with the curvature, there are things we should not be able to see and yet people are seeing it. So that has me really questioning the, the, the globe and I don't question the math because that math came from globalists. It came from people who believe the globe. <laughs> so it's not it's not math come up conjured up by flat earthers. I used to be a lifeguard on Matura Beach and on a good day, on a clear day, we could look out and see the Anacapa Arch. Well the Anacapa Arch is almost twenty miles away and it's only forty feet high. So the math says that if we're on a ball, 25,000 miles circumference ball, that the top of that 40 foot island arch should be over 200 feet below our ability to see it on the other side of the curve. I found this photo from Grandmere State Park. This is from Joshua Nowicki. And what you're seeing here is a mirage. We typically would not be able to see this from the Lake Michigan shore. We talked about this last night. Conditions are right on the lake that we're actually seeing a mirage of the Chicago skyline. Very interesting. Here's what's happening. This is a, a good example of a superior mirage. So Joshua was on the Lake Michigan shore. He was looking towards the west and Chicago's beyond the horizon. Should not be able to see it. However, with the right conditions, we have an inversion. We have cold air near the cold lake water and some relatively warmer air above it. This will bend the image of that uh, skyline back towards the viewer. And so typically we would not be able to see this. This image would be viewable from much, much higher in the sky up in space. But instead, we're able to see it on the Lake Michigan shore. Shut up, conspiracy theorist. The horizon is not the curvature of the ball Earth. The horizon is just the vanishing line of perspective from your point of view. You can use a telescope or binoculars and zoom in on the horizon and something that's been completely disappeared beyond the horizon, like a ship, can come all the way back into view, proving that that is not the curvature of the Earth you're looking at, as they tell you, but it's just the vanishing line of perspective from your point of view. And they used to, and they still use that as a proof of the ball Earth. They say that ships going away, as you see, their hulls disappear before the masthead because they're going over the curvature of the Earth. Yet we've got technology now to prove that that's wrong, but they'll still keep saying it. I put it in my videos. I'll put it right here. I'll put it in this video of me talking about this right now. You may be watching this on YouTube. You're watching a horizon shot, seeing a boat that was out of view. Now it's completely into view. So you can see that that is not the curvature of the ball earth, but there will still be 50 people in the comments section saying that that's the curvature of the ball earth. 
The idea that people are standing, ships are sailing, and planes are flying upside down on certain parts of Earth, while others tilted at 90 degrees and all other impossible angles, is complete absurdity. The idea that a man digging a hole straight down could eventually reach sky on the other side is ludicrous. Common sense tells every free-thinking person correctly that there truly is an up and down in nature, unlike the everything is relative rhetoric of the Newtonian Einsteinian paradigm. There's no curvature. It's wonderful. This is like it, this is the most amazing thing ever. There's no curve. It's flat. Can you imagine? It's exactly what we see. I cannot express this enough, but NASA is just not giving us the truth about what they know. This is crucial to understand. Forget about the flat earth for a minute if you have to. Focus on NASA and research them for a few days or for a few weeks. If you can't tell that you're being deceived, then I'm afraid that there is no use for you in this cause anyway. Check out this NASA document describing a flat motionless earth. So I came across this paper, it's an official NASA document published in August 1988 called The Derivation and Definition of a Linear Aircraft Model, and it's jam-packed full of mathematic equations, formulas, and all sorts of other stuff that describe a linear aircraft model. What I found interesting was on page 35 it says this, concluding remarks. This report derives and defines a set of linearized system matrices for a rigid aircraft of constant mass flying in a stationary atmosphere over a flat, non-rotating Earth. I'll put a link to this in the description. The other thing I'd like to mention at this point is how easily we can be fooled by two-dimensional imagery. We've been trained and conditioned to suspend disbelief when we see certain two-dimensional imagery, such as photographs. You know, a photograph is not reality. It's a photograph. And photographs can be altered and manipulated. Video is not reality. And here's some examples of that. Point is, you can't automatically trust any two-dimensional imagery or media that's presented to you by the establishment. When you try and search for a picture of Earth from space, you'll find surprisingly few of them. In fact, all of them, including this one, this is from NASA, it's called the Big Blue Marble. All of them are composites. <laughs> NASA will freely admit to them being composite images or CGI or Photoshop. It is Photoshopped, but it it's, has to be. Even the one image that is claimed to be a, an actual photograph of Earth from space is called into question simply because of a, a film that was uh, released accidentally by NASA of Apollo 11 faking the very first picture of Earth from space. So let's have a look at that video. An old reel received by mistake. It contains the raw or unedited footage of the crew of Apollo 11. Michael Collins, Edwin Aldrin Jr. and Neil Armstrong staging part of their mission for nearly an hour in living color with exceptionally clear behind the scenes audio of conversations discussing the techniques used to achieve a disingenuous picture depicting the earth at a distance in order to falsely demonstrate their far journey from it and their ability to survive passing through the Van Allen radiation belts. It cannot be misconstrued that this staging was done for some other reason, for the reel itself is slated and dated July 18th, 19th, and 20th, 1969, the very days of the mission when they were said to be approaching and achieving lunar orbit. Understand, too, that only about 20 seconds of this raw footage was ever broadcast to the public, and these conversations discussing their deception were believed to be private until now. Here they discuss that these television transmissions were in fact not broadcast live as everyone believed. They were first screened and edited for playback later. Uh, Roger, dear. We just wanted a narrative such a weekend when we get the playback we can sort of correlate. Here they discuss the fact that they have turned out the lights and have blocked out sunlight from entering the space path through the other windows as to not cause any reflected light to fall onto the spacecraft's wall in the foreground. Okay, very good. Well, we 
cut out the sun coming in some of the other windows into the spacecraft, so uh, it's looking through a, uh, the uh, number one window, and there isn't any uh, reflected light. The reason this was done is so that the truth of the matter would not be revealed. The best example of space shuttle fakery is the Challenger disaster. In 1986, the shuttle Challenger exploded about 74 seconds after takeoff, killing all seven astronauts inside. Or did it? It turns out that six of the seven are still alive and kicking today. Ellison Onizuka claims to be his identical twin brother, Claude. Yeah, I've got identical twin brother Claude too. The Challenger pilot, Mickey Smith, hasn't even bothered changing his name. He's now Professor Michael J. Smith of University of Wisconsin. Now, Krista McAuliffe was a bit of a sneaky one. She was the Challenger payload specialist, quite famous for being a teacher. It turns out during her astronaut days, she was using her middle name, Krista. And now she goes by her first name, Sharon. And she's a Syracuse law professor. The Challenger commander, Francis Richard Scobie, is now Dick Scobie, which sounds like a rather unpleasant disease, a CEO of Cows in Trees Limited. Judith Resnick, the Challenger mission specialist, again hasn't even bothered changing her name. She's a professor at Yale Law. And finally, Ronald McNair, another Challenger mission specialist, claims to be his identical twin brother, Carl McNair. What are the odds? What most people don't realise is that all the characters in this story are all actors in the same club, as George Carlin put it. Evidence that is coming from primarily NASA, the government, and the military. Three organizations that have proven to be completely untrustworthy on numerous counts. If we were to put them on trial, you know, they would all be guilty of being pathological liars. All you have to do is lie on your back on a moonless night and look around carefully. Yeah, occasionally you'll see something that looks kind of like a star, but it's moving. It's moving a little fast too, and that's actually a satellite. Now, I do accept that you can look up into the night sky and see what we're told are satellites. I've done it myself. I've seen bright lights moving across the sky, but I have no idea what those things are. In this video, you can see several large, bright objects. However, none of them appear on any satellite tracking applications. When you look up at a jet airliner, flying at 35,000 feet, you can only see it as a small dot. So how is it if something the size of a jumbo jet is rendered as a small dot at about five to seven miles up, that you can see a satellite which is the size of between a car and a school bus at a hundred miles away? You just wouldn't see it. There may be things that are way beyond the human mind's ability to comprehend. I won't even go into stars here. Stars are still 100% a mystery. All we know is that they say that they are trillions of miles away. That's for you to believe or to not believe. But planets, okay, we can see them independently. They look like luminous objects in the distance. But without NASA CGI photos where shading is added, they can't be confirmed as spheres. Through my telescope, they don't appear to have life or livable terra firma. We simply don't know what they are, but they appear to just circle around us and have something to do with the mechanics of this reality. Just because something looks like a circle doesn't make something else a ball or an oblate spheroid. It is claimed that the other planets are spheres, and so therefore Earth must also be a sphere. Firstly, Earth is a plane, not a planet, so the shape of these planets in the sky have no bearing on the shape of the Earth beneath our feet. Secondly, these planets have been known for thousands of years around the world as wandering stars, since they differ from the other fixed stars in their relative motions only. 
When looked at with an unprejudiced naked eye or through a telescope, the fixed and wandering stars appear as luminous disks of light, not spherical terra firma. The pictures and videos shown by NASA of spherical terra firma planets are all clearly fake computer-generated images and not photographs. The etymology of the word planet actually comes from the late Old English planet, or from Old French planet, from Latin planeta, from Greek planetes, planetae, wandering stars, or to wander of unknown origin, uh, to spread, or notion of spread out, from Latin planum, flat surface, plane, level, plane. They just added a T to our earth plane and everyone bought it. Here's a picture of Jupiter. This is from three separate images, okay, three separate periods, but they're always at the same angle. Now, if someone's in the North Pole, and then someone's in the South Pole on the bottom side of the globe, they would see Jupiter upside down. Now, if you're going to tell me this was taken but with a satellite, even a satellite would move in all different directions. It wouldn't take the same angle over and over again. This one has a moon in front of it, same angle. This one doesn't. This one's a little lighter, just about the same, same angle, nothing. So again, I mean, you want to talk about major bullshit. This is it right here, okay? Yeah, you might be able to see something through your telescope, but you're not seeing this, okay? In high detail like this, you're not. Not with any amateur telescope, period. Here we go. This is one. This is Europa, one of Jupiter's moons. Again, same angle. Only difference is they colored this one. It's the same damn photo. All they, all they did was darken this one. And then they put a little bit of a shading right around this edge where the pointer is on it. But it's the same damn thing. So they didn't change anything. They're not even trying that hard. They're just putting out photos. Here goes Saturn. Now this is supposedly a actual photo from a satellite. This is off NASA's website. <laughs> sure, it looks pretty, but it's not real. And they're telling you it's real and you believe it because your ego won't allow you to, to, to say, look, it's all fake. Your ego won't allow you to know the truth. Every picture we have from NASA of a planet is a artist rendering. They're not real pictures. If you take a strong telescope and look at a planet, it looks nothing like this. It looks like a self-illuminating light. It looks more like a star. Um, they used to call planets uh, wandering stars next. Saturn, I've looked at myself through high power telescopes and it really looks like a light bulb. It doesn't look like it's reflecting light. The rings are lit up. Um, there's none of these colors on there. Um, and these are just artist renderings. And if you believe that they're real, um, you're just sadly mistaken. Next, we recently had uh, Pluto, uh, pictures of Pluto, the one uh, kind of center bottom is the most recent one and that was taken by a probe that was whizzing by Pluto. Pluto's spinning, there's barely any light out there and it gets this perfect uh, brightly lit crisp clear image of Pluto and transmits it all the way back to Earth you know where we can barely get cell phone signals you know when you go out of town. Um, go to the next one and if you look at it again Disney style they show us this ridiculous picture and Pluto is actually on on Pluto. They're, they're literally laughing at us in 240 BC, a Jesuit named Eratosthenes, he calculated the Earth's circumference. He did that by planting a stick in the ground at midday so that the, the sunlight, being directly overhead, would cast no shadow. Simultaneously, about 400 miles away, somebody else planted the, the stick in the same way and found that the sunlight cast a shadow. So by taking a shadow length and knowing the distance between the sticks, you could theoretically work out the circumference of the Earth. This method requires that the sun be a long, long way away so that the light coming from the sun is all parallel. However, it turns out that you'd get exactly the same results on a flat Earth if the sun were only 3,100 miles away and 34 miles across. Amateur balloon footage taken above the clouds has provided stunning visual proof that the sun cannot be millions of miles away. In several shots, you can see a clear hot spot reflecting on the clouds directly below the sun's spotlight-like influence. If the sun were actually millions of miles away, such a small localized hot spot could not occur. 
Another proof the sun is not millions of miles away is found by tracing the angle of sun rays back to their source above the clouds. There are thousands of pictures showing how sunlight comes down through cloud cover at a variance of converging angles. The area of convergence is, of course, the sun, and is not millions of miles away, but rather relatively close to Earth, just above the clouds. We'll talk about the vanishing point a little bit. These lines are parallel the way we see. They don't look parallel here, but if you flick to the next one, these are the corners of the hallway, um, and they, go, they, they rush to the point of convergence or the vanishing point. Um, and that's how our eyes see. Everything rushes in from the sides, the top and the bottom, to our point of, um, of focus. And that's the vanishing point. The sky has no bumps on it. The sky is smooth, but the earth has bumps on it. It has mountains, it has trees, it has cars, people, waves. Anything that comes across the flat plane that even rises up a little bit will create a false horizon in front of that vanishing point. So if you look at the light on the ceiling and imagine that's the sun, it's, the sun's not getting any closer to the floor, but it is going down. And if you had some bumps in the hallway or some people standing down the hallway, the sun would disappear that light would disappear behind their heads from the bottom up, just like we observe on this plane. Let's turn our attention to the moon. Many of us have seen the moon appear full at various times throughout the day, as in this picture. But how can that happen? If you're standing at point C, then it's the middle of the night. Full moon, no problem. And if you're standing at point A, it's early in the morning. Certainly, if you stare back at the moon in the night sky, then yes, you can see a full moon. But if you're standing at point B, which is midday, that is the sun is directly overhead, then there isn't anywhere that the moon can be that will allow you to see it as full. Because the sun will be illuminating the side of the moon that is facing away from you. So the best you'll be able to see is a sliver of the moon. Think about it next time you see the full moon during the day. Every month, the moon goes through eight distinct phases. Always the same eight, always the same order. Supposedly because of a relationship between the position of the moon relative to the position of the Earth and the Sun. So, let's say it's December, and throughout the month we see the normal eight phases of the moon. But what happens when it's June, and the Earth is uh, supposedly on the other side of the Sun? Shouldn't the phases be reversed? That's not what we see. We see the same eight phases in the same order. At night, the, the craters, or the dark spots, I like to call them, are black because it's in our sky and there's black sky behind it. Next, if you look at the full moon during the day, those spots are now blue because we are seeing through whatever the moon is. Um, and to prove that, go to the next one, we have a crescent moon and behind the moon was a planet. Um, and when you zoom in, you can see the planet through the moon. Um, and it was this shot was, um, was proven that there was a planet in that position and you could see it behind the moon. And there's many people that have photographed this. Um, now, people in the north, when they're looking at the moon, they are looking at the moon in this direction. And this, of course, this moon is oversized. So it's, it's much bigger than what it really would be on this map. But the people in the south, they are looking to the north at the moon. So what they see is the opposite of what the north sees. And that's why for the south, it's upside down from the north. And it's as simple as that. So I'll cut right to the chase. Powerful Jews are operating and manipulating this reality. As of right now, it doesn't take much research to figure this out. Just to clarify, not every Jewish person is in on the conspiracy, but in the grand scheme of things, 
Wealthy Jewish families have the control. They own the Federal Reserve, they own the World Bank, they own Hollywood and the media, they own Freemasonry, and much, much more. Freemasonry is one of the oldest secret societies in the world and was born from Judaism and has nothing but Jewish terms and ideas. Freemasons are scattered across the world to serve as instruments for the elite agenda. Several of these Freemasons work for NASA. Ptolemy, who first put forward the heliocentric model, was acknowledged as the first Mason. Copernicus was a Jesuit priest. Sir Isaac Newton was a Freemason. All the astronauts are Freemasons. So you can see how this lie could work if all these celebrated people are telling the same story. Nicholas Copernicus, Johannes Kepler, Galileo Galilei, and Isaac Newton, the four forefathers of the globalist heliocentric doctrine, all posed for Masonic portraits, highlighting various symbols and hand signs denoting their affiliation with the Brotherhood. Galileo poses on a Masonic checkerboard floor, Kepler with the hidden hand sign, and all four of them pose with a Masonic compass and globe while flashing the Masonic M hand sign. Sir Isaac Newton was even knighted by Queen Anne at Trinity's College Masonic Master's Lodge. An inordinate number of NASA astronauts, the current propagators of the globalist heliocentric doctrine, are or were admitted Freemasons as well. John Glenn, two-time U.S. Senator and one of NASA's first astronauts, is a known Mason. Buzz Aldrin Jr., the second man to lie about walking on the moon, is an admitted ring-wearing, hand-signed, flashing 33rd degree Mason from Montclair Lodge No. 144 in New Jersey. Edgar Mitchell, another supposed moonwalker aboard Apollo 14, is an Order of de Molay Mason at Artesta Lodge No. 29 in New Mexico. James Irwin of Apollo 15, the last man to lie about walking on the moon, was a Tihon Lodge No. 104 member in Colorado Springs. Don Isell on Apollo 7 was a member of the Luther B. Turner Lodge No. 732 in Ohio. Gordon Cooper aboard Mercury 9 and Gemini 5 was a Master Mason in Carbondale Lodge No. 82 in Colorado. Virgil Grisham on Apollo 1 and 15, Mercury 5 and Gemini 3 was a Master Mason from Mitchell Lodge No. 228 in Indiana. Walter Shearer Jr. on Apollo 7, Sigma 7, Gemini 6, and Mercury 8 was a 33rd degree Mason at Canaveral Lodge No. 339 in Florida. Thomas Stafford on Apollo 10 and 18, Gemini 7 and 9, was a Mason at Western Star Lodge No. 138 in Oklahoma. Paul Weitz on Skylab 2 and Challenger is from Lawrence Lodge No. 708 in Pennsylvania. NASA astronauts Neil Armstrong, Alan Shepard, William Pogue, Vance Brand, and Anthony England all had fathers who were Freemasons too. The amount of astronauts known to be Freemasons or from Freemasonic families is astonishing. It is likely that more astronauts and people of key importance in NASA are affiliated with the Brotherhood as well, but not so open about their membership. For there to be this many Masons, members of the world's largest and oldest secret society, involved with the promotion and propagation of this globalist heliocentric doctrine from its outset to today, should raise some serious suspicion. I'm still surprised how often I see the globe in corporate logos. Almost every piece of media I look at, including commercials, magazines, and music videos, and album covers. I mean, it's a lot. And the rest of us describe a ball earth as where we live because we don't know any better. When it's drilled into your head as fact before you even get to the third grade, you end up with that core belief, a belief that's hard to part with. We all have a little bit of ego and we don't want to be wrong, but this flat earth epiphany is rousing us from our sleep and we're now noticing the massive amounts of programming. The world has been systematically brainwashed and indoctrinated for centuries into believing the greatest lie of all time, that the earth is a spinning globe. Decades of programming through entertainment media, over a hundred years of science fiction books, and stories and television programs and films. I must admit to being a science fiction fan myself. I grew up watching Star Trek, Star Wars, Babylon 5, Battlestar Galactica, watching films like 2001, 
2010. I truly believed that our future lay in space. I saw an exciting future for mankind. Moon bases, Mars bases, interstellar travel. But now I sincerely doubt there is any such thing as space. It really is simple, believe it or not. Why were we all taught the globe from the time we could walk? Why are we all told it's the absolute unquestionable fact of all facts? Why are we told Flat Earth is stupid, ancient, and primitive? Why are we shown globes in every logo, and why are they in every classroom? Well, that's simple. Because it's not possible to live on a globe. You can't live on a sphere. I get it. They taught us that we can and do. Yet they forgot something very important to the truth, and that's called proof, or evidence. Without it, the only way to teach it is by forcing it down our throats from the age of three. It's simple, because worldwide governments and agencies trying to falsify where you live in your mind is the epitome of mind control. Think about it. History is already obscure and shrouded in secrecy. We don't know our true origins. What better than to also hide where we are and what our natural purpose is? We are considered cattle, goyim, easily fooled and easily swayed by the mainstream media. Our society is engineered, and the ideas that we think are our own are actually pre-manufactured by entities such as the Tavistock Institute, and then it's seeded into our minds through movies, TV shows, and music. When one doesn't recognize this, they are essentially controlled in every way without even knowing it. I have knowledge of this and I'm still controlled by time and money and other things, trying to find out what they know and also what they don't want us to know is important and one of the things that they are keeping from us is our home. This is the case, if this flat earth is our universe, then it elevates man and this earth to supreme importance, where every life, human or otherwise, is significant and sacred. And when we all realize that, then the world, the universe, changes. Why don't they care? Well, it's not, it's not that they don't care, it's that they don't know that it's true, and even if it is true, they, they can't see how deep this goes, so they're not, they don't understand why it's even relevant or important. The shape of the earth doesn't seem that important until you really expound upon the deepness of this conspiracy and how far-reaching it is. To me, it matters because if they're going to lie about something like what the earth actually is, then there's no limit to what they will lie about. We're a random sneeze, we're an accident, we just blew up and molecules started spinning around together and eventually a fish crawled up onto water and turned into a monkey and that turned into you and here we are. That's what they're trying to tell you. Think about how that makes you feel metaphysically. Where, where does that place you as a speck of dust in the corner of the universe? You can see the Earth is flat, you can feel the Earth is stationary, but according to the gospel of modern astronomy, you are wrong and a simpleton worthy of endless ridicule if you dare to trust your own eyes and experience. As much as people like to ridicule it and laugh about it and claim like there's no proof for it, when you really start digging into it, not only will you find reams and reams of proof and evidence for the flat Earth, you're going to find that there's no evidence whatsoever for the spinning ball Earth. The Earth is flat. The whole, uh... You know, all the information about how the planet is a sphere is made up by NASA. It's a NASA conspiracy. They're just trying to find ways to get more funding, more money. But in reality, the Earth is flat and it's and the rim is completely uh, closed off by this massive ice wall, kind of like in the Game of Thrones. Why do they believe this conspiracy? I, I don't understand what the point of it is. Do you see what I'm saying? I know. Like, what they is... are lunatics. Okay. And, and I think what it is, is that there is a certain group of people who have a psychological condition where they're paranoid about everything. Mm -hmm. And so this feeds into it. They're like, yes, I knew it. It is known that the Earth is flat. Oh, so what's behind you? The behind me, there is a wall of ice that goes up to space. <laughs>
But why would there be a wall of ice if you're in Dothraki and you're in a Dothraki field? I am near the Dothraki Sea. Oh, oh, is that right? Okay. It was a great pleasure, and thank you for saving us from falling off the earth. The pleasure is mine. <laughs> okay. Once you start seeing past this illusion, and you accept that things aren't adding up, you also start to notice how this subject is heavily and unnecessarily ridiculed. It's the single most taboo topic in this day and age, yet the evidence for the flat earth and the lack thereof for the spherical earth have a different story that desires to be heard, and some people are hearing it. We're waking up and we don't care if you can't handle it, others will handle it and you'll be left with your pride and a flat earth kernel in your brain driving you mad. Free yourself from this insanity, at least if you truly don't care, focus your attention someplace else. There's no need to feed all of your energy into something that you thoroughly don't believe. We would love to have you on board, but we don't need you. You stay firmly put while the rest of us try to unlock the doors to the real knowledge. Prepare for the onslaught of NASA brainwashed uh, zombies that are going to come your way thinking that they know everything about the spinning ball they're living on. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories. The world is flat. And it's a conspiracy of scientists and others who publish these pictures. Uh, the evidence is remarkable. People like me have not done our job. But uh, shooting the messenger isn't going to change the science. Don't give me the don't give me the conspiracy bullshit. Come on, you're you're a more intelligent man than that. Well, come on, come on. I mean, come on. Listen, listen. There has never been a conspiracy. All that's left now is ad hominem attacks. says the earth is round and someone says the earth is flat at some point you're going to make a judgment this the earth is flat people is just flat everybody has the exact same response we all have the same response this is crazy this is stupid this is absurd why are you even thinking what are you you've lost your mind we all have the same initial response but for those who actually take one day one day to try to research this stuff for themselves at the very least they become hooked and have to spend another day and another day and the more you spend looking into it the more you're going i don't know what to believe Clearly flat. 
So mainstream science tells us that the Earth formed 4.6 billion years ago, after a big bang that created the known universe. This wild theory is widely accepted as fact, and it's mechanically repeated by most people due to the fact that it's what public schools teach to the kids without challenge. There is absolutely no possible way to determine whether or not an event took place that long ago. It's actually very strange that anyone would believe this nonsense. Mainstream science also tells us that life on Earth evolved into monkeys, which eventually evolved into us. There's only one huge gaping problem with the theory of evolution. We are not only missing one link between monkeys and humans, but we are missing hundreds, if not thousands, of evolutionary links. Maybe more. They want us to believe that one day, we fell out of a monkey's ass, and we landed on a spinning ball that's advancing through outer space at ridiculous speeds. We are being deceived. Let's put it in perspective. They think they came from monkeys, okay? I don't care how many letters they have after their name. You know, these guys go to school, they read books, they come out believing they came from monkeys, and then they have the audacity to say that we're the stupid ones. Listen to what they have to say. In the beginning, there was darkness, and then, bang, giving birth to an endless expanding existence of time, space, and matter. Every day, new discoveries are unlocking the mysterious, the mind-blowing, the deadly secrets of a place we call the universe. It is, of course, a mystery as to why the universe exists in such an intelligible manner. But it suggests to me, at least, that there's a deep link between the universe, the grand scheme that's unfolding, and beings like ourselves. Somehow, the universe has become self-aware. It's engineered the emergence of comprehending, thinking beings like ourselves who can come to know the universe. Some people marvel at the fact that the universe has, over billions of years, given birth to beings who can appreciate its complexity. We can even ponder where and how we fit in. But at the dawn of history, people thought they knew the answers to these profound questions. The ancients viewed their world as a snow globe. It was essentially a flat earth, say a disk, covered by a dome. Uh, and we call this in English a firmament. And in the firmament is where all the stars and the planets were hung. Almost all ancient cultures believed their universe existed in a dome similar to this one and they never questioned who created it. The ancients assumed that there was a god or gods responsible for the creation and the maintenance of the universe. The idea that God created the universe went largely unchallenged until the Middle Ages, when scientists made a sacrilegious suggestion based on their observations. The sun, not the Earth, was at the center of the universe. It was a paradigm shift. There is now another way to explain the naturally occurring phenomena around us, and this is science. Since the Middle Ages, scientists have developed sophisticated new theories about the enormity of the universe and our place in it. Theories that often have no room for God. Many phenomena have appeared mysterious or miraculous or magical. And then through the process of science, we've eventually understood them. Scientists gradually realize that the sun really is just one star among a multitude of stars in a gigantic galaxy, having hundreds of billions of such stars. And all this was created in a big bang 13.7 billion years ago. But while scientific theories, observations, and experiments tell us where we are in the cosmos, they don't answer the eternal questions. Why we're here, and who, if anyone, created us? So while it appears a divine creator planned the universe, many physicists say apparent fine-tuning doesn't prove anything of the sort. Something else must be at work. But what, other than God, could possibly explain the remarkable series of events that led to the creation of life in our universe? 
One very popular contender is an idea that seems at least as incredible as the idea of God. It's the multiple universe theory. A very large number of universes, perhaps even an infinite number, could in principle exist in a vast hyperspace. We can understand the idea of hyperspace by comparing it to a mug of beer. The beer mug would be the hyperspace and the bubbles would be these individual universes. The bubbles in a beer mug are all physically about the same. But suppose they span a range of properties. Some of them might have carbon and oxygen and stars and gravity, and others don't. We would be in one of the ones that leads to a rich, complex universe culminating with life as we know it. If there are an infinite number of other universes, the fine-tuning that seems to be present in ours isn't an example of God's plan, but rather the law of statistics. Most of these universes wouldn't naturally develop in ways that fostered intelligent life. But a few would. So then the explanation for the specialness of the universe is that we are winners in a gigantic cosmic lottery. It stands to reason that we couldn't be living and discussing this in a universe that was hostile to life. Only the bio-friendly ones get populated with thinking beings. Having a multitude of universes is actually quite a simple and natural consequence of some of the most favored models for the birth and early evolution of our universe. It's kind of like stars and planets. As long as you have the capacity to make one, it's easy to make lots of them. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Evolution isn't the only thing we are being lied to about. The Earth under our feet has been molded into a spinning ball that is a byproduct of the Big Bang, which is a theory that was introduced to science in 1931. In order for the theory of evolution to be reasonable, the Big Bang that was somehow pinpointed to 13.7 billion years ago has to be true. In the Big Bang cosmology, the Earth is a rotating sphere orbiting around the Sun. The issue is that the motion of the Earth has never been detected, and here we are in the year 2016 looking for the curvature of our world, which also can't seem to be measured. Mainstream science using theory after problematic theory to try and prove another theory isn't science at all. Real science will reveal a stationary Earth that's turning out to be quite flat, with a sun that's much closer than we are told. Despite what you hear, Flat Earthers aren't anti-science at all. We just don't condone what mainstream science has become. And that's a faith-based religion swarming with lies and ludicrous theories that have never been proven. Also, this re-emergence of the Flat Earth has little to do with the Flat Earth Society. If you have the desire to further look into this, don't check for answers on their website. Some of the claims made by the Flat Earth Society are decent, while others are absurd. This is a common ploy to encourage no further investigation by the controlled opposition known as the Flat Earth Society. It's a commonly held misconception that the Earth is a spherical object that revolves around the Sun. But the fact is, of course, that the Earth is a circular dish surrounded by a barrier of ice that explorers have been attempting to penetrate for centuries. What if gravity isn't real? What if the Earth is in fact flat and science has been wrong all along? Everything that you've been taught is a lie. We're shown that and told that's the solar system, that's the way it works. You've got the big sun in the middle and all the planets revolve around it, but nobody's ever seen that. We've never seen a photograph of it. <clears throat> We've never seen uh, you know, real part. We've certainly never seen any, any animation of it, even though there's supposed to be a probe out in Pluto at the moment. Um, no one's ever seen the solar system like this. It's always graphics, it's always secondary knowledge. Things that people hold dear and call fact, like gravity, like the age of the universe, the uh, universe formation itself, the age of the Earth, they're all dependent on things that are unproven. While they're good to consider, we should consider everything, you have allowed them to become facts that appear in our textbooks taught by professors to kids as facts.
The argument, for all practical purposes, came to an end when the Church of England was established by law during the 16th century. They embraced many radical scientific notions prevalent at the time, including Copernicus' round earth theory. With this endorsement, the theory found its way into the schools, which were then largely controlled by the church. It has remained there to this day, and many children have accepted it without question. All seeing eye and the square compasses. Here we have Buzz Aldrin, the second man, supposedly that walked on the grey dust of Kubrick's film set. Showing off, they don't try and hide it, it's amazing. There's his Miss Masonic ring, he's got his Shriner hat there. And these guys, yeah, they're supposedly praying to the command module. Looks like a pyramid to me. The connections between Ron L. Hubbard, or Elwon Hubbard, who started the Scientology movement, Walt Disney, Bernard von Braun, rocket scientist, Jack Doug Parsons, also a rocket scientist, Jet Propulsion's laboratory, and Alistair Crowley, who's obviously you know an art Satanist, uh, influenced a lot of you know rock music and and you know everything else, sort of the OTO, the Ordo Tempera Orientis. Um, these guys were all are all connected. They're all in the same brotherhood. Um, the connections between, well, here, here you go. Jack Parsons, uh, the JPL was how obviously NASA got into, you know, got, got into the air in the first place, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Here's Jack Parsons at a Masonic ceremony, you can tell by the floor. And um, again, you can look into this for yourself. Yeah, There's, it's easily, it's not, it's not, you know, it's easily searchable, it's easily researchable information, the connection between Walt Disney. Here we have aboard the ISS. Again, now, now we're getting into the handshakes. Uh, we've got Baphomet all doing it. Yeah, we've seen Bill Clinton do that and Bush and all, all these guys give you that. We know what that means. We know who they're in service to. This is all about occultism. It's all about sun worship, heliocentrism. It's not science. It's about, it's a religion, it's a faith. This is Helios. This is Helios the sun god. And here, you know, here he's on the badge of Apollo 13. This is all occult religion going all the way back through all Egypt and then back through to Babylon as well. Life is much simpler on a flat plane. There's no complex theories or complicated mathematics involved in it. The flat plane. You know, there's uh, sea level is level everywhere you go at sea level is it's sea level there's no bending there's no bending the ocean around a spinning ball it's level it's all, water finds its level and it maintains there's you can't bend it around a ball this idea these facts they're facts resonating with people all over the world is not an accident. It's not a coincidence. That is the hardest part for you guys to understand. The people that argue with me, that want to make me feel like a fucking idiot, that's not you talking. That's your ego talking. That's you have to convince yourself verbally to somebody who is challenging your own beliefs to make yourself feel better and to help you sleep at night. The Flat Earth is a perfect example of that. You refuse to look at the information. It's stupid. Well, why is it stupid? Well, it just is. Well, you... Every little thing that you've brought up, all of you, can be refuted and explained differently, but you refuse to see that. You refuse to look at it. That makes you ignorant. That, that is the definition of ignorance. So how does Hollywood brainwash you? Well, one way is like this. They begin their movies on a globe and then they zoom in to whatever the first scene is. Real clever way to brainwash you in the very first scene of any movie you see. Universal Studios is so bad, they use this goddamn globe as their logo, as their intro to every single movie that they make. At the beginning of every single movie Universal makes, you're gonna see the spinning globe logo. So it doesn't even matter what the movie's about. You're gonna be brainwashed. No video. 
real video of the real Earth spinning in space, which you could all like to see actually exists. This is what he's shown. This is last year from the Discover Satellite, the Epic um, camera. This is actually the dark side of the moon. Going past the Earth. There's the Earth spinning. And there's the dark side of the moon. The only problem with that is the moon's supposed to be orbiting the Earth, not just flying straight past it. Your eyes aren't fooled, yeah? You've got your own senses, trust your senses. This is clearly CGI, but you go to NASA's website and they will claim this was taken from a million miles away from Earth by the Discover satellite. You will notice also that the clouds don't really move. I mean, they move across, but they don't change, don't swirl, they don't change direction. Um, five hours, 3.50 to 8.45 is nearly five hours of time-lapse photography. Those 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 clouds do not move at all. You ever been mind fucked before? We don't have a picture of our Earth, except for the nice composite fake images NASA gives you to make sure you keep believing you're in a ball and keep arguing on their behalf, keep fighting for them, keep telling people we went to the moon simply because you can't let your mind think of the possibility that someone lied to you. The government lied to you. They can't lie. They're my government. Believe me, it's hard for all of us. That's crazy. The government doesn't lie to people. I was a huge Star Wars fan. Very, very disappointed to find out that I'm just being programmed. Again, it's a multi, multi-pronged approach to show you in, you know, they're not trying to pretend that Star Wars is real in any way, but again, it's impressing your brain again and again and again that the space and planets and, and spaceships and they're all round and everything else, okay? It's Hollywood. So now we've got the ISS. Does this look solid? Is this like a solid machine to you? But how do we know these are real? We don't. But i tell you what you don't see from the ISS, which you really should and you never do, is one of the 17,000 satellites that are also supposed to be spinning around up there as well. What difference does it make if it's a globe or if it's flat? They're stealing your money and showing you cartoons in CGI. Wouldn't that make a difference if it was a globe or if it was flat? Because they keep showing you cartoons of a globe. They show you CGI of a globe. They show you Hollywood trickery of a globe. They're stealing your fucking money. That's flat. That begs the question, hey, what the hell have you been showing us this ball for all this time? What have you been doing with our money? Did you guys go to space? Is evolution actually real? Did you guys just make this shit up? See, these are the questions we need to be asking. There might be more land out there to be discovered. There might be a fucking firmament up there. We don't know. They've stolen our mind from us and stuck us on a cartoon ball. We are being lied to, controlled, manipulated, stolen from. And I'm not going to stop speaking out. There's a quote by Tesla. Today's scientists have substituted mathematics for experiments. And they wander off through equation after equation and eventually build a structure which has no relation to reality. That's what happened with the globe theory. Uh, everybody knew the world was flat until one day some guy came along and said, oh no, no, it's, it's a ball. We're, we're spinning through space. We're circling the sun. A lie is a lie, even if everybody believes it. And truth is truth, even if no one believes it. Ptolemy refined a system with Earth at the center. For 1,500 years, Ptolemy's system was used as the basis of astronomy and calendars, and it worked quite well. Copernicus hated that, and Copernicus set about to undo Ptolemy's greatest discovery. While working at the request of Pope Leo X on improvements to the Julian calendar, Copernicus conceived what turned out to be the foundational idea of modernity itself, the idea that the Earth moved. Not all were persuaded by Copernicus, however. The greatest astronomer of the time, 
Tycho Brahe, developed a new geocentric model. The Earth occupies the center, the planets orbit the Sun, and the Sun orbits the Earth. They basically stole our minds and enslaved us by showing us a picture of a ball. Said, here's what you live on, it's a ball. And then they show us a different picture of a ball. Here's a different picture of a ball. And everyone's just like, yeah, that's the same place. It doesn't matter if the colors of the continents change. It doesn't matter if the color of the oceans change. It doesn't matter if the continents change sizes, change locations. Tycho hired a young assistant named Johannes Kepler in 1600. Kepler, working on his own development of the Copernican system, needed Tycho's observations, but Tycho refused to part with them. When Tycho died suddenly and mysteriously in 1601, Kepler took charge of Tycho's observations and used them to develop his own system. In Kepler's system, the sun is in the center while the planets move on ellipses, non-uniformly. The ellipse with its two foci allows us to see that Ptolemy's epicycles and equant were actually a brilliant attempt to express non-uniform motion centuries before Kepler. Indeed, once the concept of non-uniform motion is introduced, all of these systems can be shown to be geometrically identical. Copernicus was the main guy who started off the revolution. His book on the revolutions of the celestial spheres changed, you know, thousands of years of thinking about the Earth being completely still, as you can experience it for yourself every single day of your life, and the, obviously the bodies move, move in the heavens above us. That's what your senses experience. Copernicus uh, changed all that round, but he didn't use any science. There's no science in his book. He got his ideas from the Hermetica, from Hermes Trismegistus. And it basically says how the sun sits enthroned in the middle of the uh, in the middle of the solar system, and we all orbit around it. What's that sound like to you? That sounds like sun worship. It sounds like sun cult to me. Because later on, I'm going to show you. Hoyle, uh, Fred Hoyle was another astronomer. Well, he said there's no difference in, in the mathematics, whether it's geocentric or helix. So, with the sun moves around the earth, the earth moves around the sun. The maths works the same, exactly the way. The connections between just just for, just from the imagery. Yeah, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be, um, you know, uh, have a portrait done with a big 33 on it or, or a triangle with an eye or anything like that. I wouldn't want to be connected or associated with any of that stuff because, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm not really into that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm working for the other side. Um, so, but Copernicus obviously had no problem with the square, with the square and compass, yeah? Um, with the big wheel here, we've got the big sun wheel and we've got the Mercury sign as well. Yeah, it all leads back again. I'll, you know, you, you can you can um, investigate that more for yourself. The Book of Thoth by Alistair Crowley, Freemasonry with the sun over the head. Yeah, as above, so below. Yeah, um, one of the reasons why Mercury, because it can rise in the morning and the night, so it's also hermaphroditic. Uh, both sexes, which is obviously is Baphomet as well, which we know as the the, the breasts and the penis. It goes on and on and on. It's all about cult sun worship. You can trace it back to Babylon. You can see all the different gods going through it. But there is no science to Copernicus's um, on the revolutions of the spheres. Uh, it's it's a philosophical trap, and it's all based on the Hermetica. Up is up. Down is down. If I a visual aid, I have a pin. If I release it from my grip, what happens? Anybody? Correct. It falls. Was that gravity? No. The molecules that make up this pen, the plastic, the ink, it's got a little rubber grip on it, are more dense than the molecules of the air surrounding it. The molecules of the air will not support the weight so they fall, so it falls when you let go. Like that. Density and mass make an object heavy. There's no there's no gravity. Simple. Up is up, down is down. Objects fall because they're heavy. If it floats, it's lighter than air. Helium, fill a balloon with helium, it goes up. If you filled it with hydrogen, it would also go up. Lighter than air, floats. 
Heavier than air? Balls. It's not complicated. Gravity is a god because it's the answer. It's the magic answer to everything. Why? How does this? How does the? How does the Earth keep us on, but it still spins around? It still orbits and all gravity. How's the moon? How's the type of gravity? Why doesn't the moon fly off to the sun? Because the sun's got bigger gra gravity. It's the way gravity works. Don't worry about it, it's gravity. Gravity is the god that explains everything very, very magically. There is no need for gravity whatsoever if we're on a fixed stationary plane and the, the heavenly bodies are, are simply going above us. The reason why you don't fall off is because you're denser than the air that un underneath you. It's just again Occam's race. It's a straightforward explanation. Basically, the perspective of living on a globe is preposterous. It's ridiculous. It's hilarious how we are taught to perceive the world we live on because basically even when trying to <laughs> depict it it's hilarious they have no way of depicting it without it being comical you have whales climbing <laughs> the curve like it's absurd how could we live on a globe core of the earth you know that you've seen the cutaway this much is crust and mantle and magma and liquid molten stuff at the center um, the deepest hole that's ever been drilled in the history of mankind to date even with today's technology eight miles if you want to say this is what the first eight miles looks like, I will believe you because they can show me the hole. This goes eight miles down, okay? It goes eight miles down. That's how thick is the plane that we live on? It's at least eight miles because <laughs> they've drilled down that far, but they can't go any farther. It just, it doesn't work. So, it's speculation. With a sphere of 4,000 miles radius being a, a spun round once every 24 hours, a little bit of calculations will show that that person there is being spun round at about 1,000 miles an hour and it doesn't know it? I mean, this is obvious nonsense. The stage was set for one of the most important events in the history of physics, the Michelson-Morley experiment. The experiment failed to detect the Earth moving in or against the ether. The problem was serious. Although various solutions were advanced, in the end, science was faced with a choice. Either discard the ether or admit that the Earth wasn't orbiting the Sun. It was Albert Einstein who came up with the solution, which now forms the basis of our physics and which we call the theory of relativity. Einstein eliminated the ether as the cause and said that it was simply a principle of nature. That when objects move through empty space, they contract in length, they decrease in the time traveled, and their mass increases, all by the same proportion. Hence, in order to maintain the Copernican principle, the length, time, and mass of moving objects were altered. And this is the essence of Einstein's special theory of relativity. All of physics collapses with that experiment. Foucault's pendulums do not uniformly swing in any one direction. Sometimes they rotate clockwise and sometimes counterclockwise. Sometimes they fail to rotate and sometimes they rotate far too much. Scientists who have repeated variations of the experiment have conceded time and again that Quote, it was difficult to avoid giving the pendulum some slight lateral bias at starting. The behavior of the pendulum actually depends on, one, the initial force beginning its swing, and two, the ball and socket joint used which most readily facilitates circular motion over any other. The supposed rotation of the earth is completely inconsequential and irrelevant to the pendulum's swing. If the alleged constant rotation of the Earth affected pendulums in any way, then there should be no need to manually start pendulums in motion. If Earth's diurnal rotation caused the 360 degree uniform rotation of pendulums, then there should not exist a stationary pendulum anywhere on Earth. It has been said that the pendulum experiment proves the rotation of the Earth. This is quite impossible, for one pendulum turns one way, and sometimes another pendulum turns in the opposite direction. 
Now we ask, does the Earth rotate in opposite directions at different places at one and the same time? We should like to know. Perhaps the experimenters will kindly enlighten us on this point. There's all kinds of evidence for the phenomenon of what's called continental drift. That, this means that the, the continents are able to move as if they're floating on a fluid. Now, if the Earth is, is spherical, if it's spinning, can any, anybody knows that if this is spinning very, very, very fast like that, that the continents should all be located at the equator. Because centrifugal force would move the continents from the poles to the middle. The Coriolis effect is often said to cause sinks and toilet bowls in the northern hemisphere to drain spinning in one direction, while in the southern hemisphere causing them to spin the opposite way, thus providing proof of the spinning ball earth. Once again, however, just like Foucault's pendulums spinning either which way, sinks and toilets in the northern and southern hemisphere do not constantly spin in any one direction. Sinks and toilets in the very same household are often found to spin in opposite directions, depending entirely upon the shape of the basin and the angle of the water's entry, not the supposed rotation of the Earth. Jennifer Horton wrote, while the premise makes sense that the Earth's eastward spin would cause the water in a toilet bowl to spin as well, in reality, the force and speed at which the water enters and leaves the receptacle is much too great to be influenced by something as minuscule as a single 360-degree turn over the span of a day. When all is said and done, the Coriolis effect plays no larger a role in toilet flushes than it does in the revolution of CDs in your stereo. The things that really determine the direction in which water leaves your toilet or sink are the shape of the bowl and the angle at which the liquid initially enters the bowl. The Coriolis effect is also said to affect bullet trajectories and weather patterns as well, supposedly causing most storms in the northern hemisphere to rotate counterclockwise and most storms in the southern hemisphere to rotate clockwise, to cause bullets from long-range guns to tend towards the right of the target in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. Again, however, the same problems remain. Not every bullet and not every storm consistently displays the behavior and therefore cannot reasonably be used as proof of anything. They got us to ridicule it, and that was the genius in their whole plan. If you ridicule something socially, it's, it's ridiculous, so I'm not going to look into it. When if you think about it, up, if you flip it inside out, to assume the Earth is flat is so, makes so much sense. To assume it's a globe is so ridiculous. We should have laughed at that, you know? And it's funny how people who still believe in the sphere always make fun of the flat Earth because they'll say, well, how should I, how can I stay on? I'll fall off. I mean, that, that's ridiculous. I'll fall off. Yet they have total faith in not rolling, tumbling down the sphere. For some reason, this appears safe to them. You know, it's like, no, wouldn't a level surface appear more sensible and safe if you really think about it? People say, well, go look at the planets. The planets are, are spheres, so that means we're a sphere. No, whip out a telescope. I've got one. Whip out your telescope and look at Mars. It's a dot of light. It's an orange dot. And then when you look at a NASA image, it's this desert world with canyons and ice and craters and shit but when you look at it through an amateur telescope like a good amateur telescope not one from fucking walmart like a good one it's an orange dot it's not a desert world with canyons and shit that they went to there's no rover on mars <laughs> They're prepping us with movies like The Martian so they can steal our money on a fake trip to Mars. Just like they stole our money on a fake trip to the moon. Behold, the mysterious floating orb! <laughs> don't need all the complex theories and math. The sun isn't 93 million miles away. It's much closer, much closer, and much smaller. Oh, it's 400 times bigger than the moon. 
but it's also 400 times farther away, so it appears to be the same size. The sun and moon are the same size, and they're not as far as they say they are. They circle above the plane that we live on, the flat plane, they circle. The sun shines down like a spotlight for around 24 hours. The same phenomenon Eratosthenes measured could be explained by a flat Earth if the sun were only a few thousand miles away and 32 miles across. The math would work out the same. Once you know, once you realize what's going on, you're on a flat plane, you can see the sun. It's like it moves towards you, passes overhead, it moves away from you. It's perspective, the distance, it moves that direction until it reaches the vanishing point, the point of convergence on the horizon where you can no longer see its light. Um, this is a really, really good video to watch. It's called The Ama Amazing Flight of a Balloon to the Edge of Space. And if you watch it, you will see, because those are clouds there. This isn't, this isn't the ocean, this is clouds. And what have we got here? That's a hot spot from the sun. Now, if the sun's 93 million miles away, yeah, but, but massive, how is it causing a heat spot on here? Well, so this is a still for me, you can watch the video for yourself, but this is what it does, there's minutes and minutes of this video as it spins around and you can see it again and again. It will blow your mind because you'll see the sun isn't that far away at all, because it can't be causing a heat spot on the clouds if it's 93 million miles away. If it's massive, it should all be coming in at the same angle, there should be no. The sun is obviously not 93 million miles away, it looks very close. Circumnavigation is really just a flat circle path. Gravity as we know it simply doesn't exist. The sailor thinks that he's traveling around the Earth this way, when in effect he's traveling around the Earth this way. And he's creating a circle. He's, he's moving in a continuous direction around. He goes through the various parts of the circle and he comes back where he started from. He's going around this way. One of heliocentrists' favorite supposed proofs of their ball earth theory is the ability for ships and planes to circumnavigate, to sail or fly at right angles to the North Pole, and eventually return to their original location. Since the North Pole and Antarctica are covered in ice and guarded no-fly zones, however, no ships or planes have ever been known to circumnavigate the Earth in north-south directions, only east-west. And herein lies the rub. East or westbound circumnavigation can just as easily be performed on a flat plane as it can on a globular sphere. Just as a compass can place its center point on a flat piece of paper and trace a circle either way around the pole, so can a ship or plane circumnavigate a flat earth. The only kind of circumnavigation which could not happen on a flat earth is north-south bound, which is likely the very reason for the heavily enforced flight restrictions. Flight restrictions originating from none other than the United Nations, the same United Nations which haughtily uses the flat earth map as its official logo and flag. So the ball earther's logical argument is that only a globe can be circumnavigated, the earth has been circumnavigated, and therefore the earth is a globe. This is indeed a logical modus ponens statement, but the conclusion is rendered invalid because the first premise, that only a globe can be circumnavigated, is categorically false. There is no curve, man. You went up on top of your house and saw the curvature, you went on a plane and saw the curve. No, you didn't. There is no curvature. You know how I know? I tried to debunk the flat earth and I failed. That's how most of us get started. We try to debunk the flat earth and we fail. There's no evidence <clears throat> for curvature when you use your own senses and your own observations. Cross Lake Michigan from St. Joseph to Chicago is 60 miles. Over 60 miles to anything under 2,400 feet should not be seen. This is a visual of how that works. See the blue, leather, obviously the green line is you, you're straight out. If you're looking straight out, obviously the, the Earth's supposed to curve, so the blue line is where it curves. Anything beyond the blue line should not be seen. Sears Tower is only 450 feet high. It's the highest, obviously, building in Chicago. It's giving you the heights of some of the rest of the um, buildings there. There's quite a famous picture, uh, a guy called Joshua Inouye. 
of Chicago from 60 miles away. We shouldn't be able to see any of it. It should be all behind 2,400 feet of curve. Yeah? Now, people say, ah, but you can't see the bottom of the... You know, it's proven that the Earth's curved because you can't see the bottom of it. But you can't see the bottom of it because seas and lakes, they wave. They go up and down. They're not completely... I mean, obviously, if it's completely flat and completely clear, then you'll, you'll, you'll see a lot more of it. But this actually proves that the, that, the, that the picture wasn't taken from very high above sea level. If it was, you, you, you'd see a lot more of the buildings, like in this next one. From slightly closer, from only 37 miles away, and should be behind 900 feet of curve, I think we can see more than 500 feet of the Sears Tower there, but you can see virtually all of the skyline. Because obviously it's a clearer day, it's a little bit brighter, and obviously the, the waves aren't as choppy. Here's the opposite, there's, the, you know, there's 36 miles of waves in between. Why would we see the whole thing? But we can still see far more of it, it should be 840 feet a drop. We shouldn't be able to see, oh, we should be able to see less than, less than the top half of those. We move on to a different city, Toronto, across Lake Ontario, a place called Grimsby. Obviously not in Lincolnshire. 37 miles away, so be behind 900 feet of curve. The CN Tower is 1,800 feet tall. You should be able to see only the top half of that and hardly any of the rest of Toronto. Can we see pretty much the whole skyline there? Again, you can check this out for yourself. I, I, I had a, I, you know, you can get half a dozen of these pictures from various places all around this bay. Yeah, this is actually taken from the red lines there. That's actually the crimson is here. So it's actually a little bit further than this red line, but you can get pictures of, from Toronto from all over this beach. Yeah, and you can see way more of it than we should be. Now, people say, "Oh, well, that's light refracting, bending it round the curve." <laughs> it doesn't look like a mirage. I've seen mirages; they're inverted or the wavy. We know what a mirage looks like. That's just that we can see it in the distance. 81 miles away from Genoa, it's the Isle of Gorgona. It's only 70 feet above sea level. We shouldn't be able to see any of We should be able to see the tip of it. We can see most of the island. It should be behind 4,300 feet of curve. It should have curved away by now. We can still see it. We're going to bring it closer back home. The Isle of Man from the File Co. 61 miles away. And again, we can't just see the tops of the turbines. We can see virtually all of them. From 61 miles away, Snaefell is 2,030 feet high, 2,034 feet high, so that's the highest point on the Isle of Man. 61 miles away should be 2,480 feet of curvature. Should be, you know, half a mile below that horizon. From London, 75 miles away. Starts getting interesting when you go, when you start getting towards the 100 mile mark. We're talking over a mile of dip now. This is the Isle, Isle of Oahu. Taking from Kaui, Kaua, Kaua, thank you, in Hawaii. It's 90 miles away. Again, you can see, you know, apart from, you know, whatever bit the waves are hiding, we can see a lot of that island. And here's, here's the numbers for it. It should be behind 5,400 feet a drop. Its elevation is 4,003 feet. So we shouldn't even be able to see the tip of it. You can see nearly all of it. This is the Sierra Nevada range from Mount Diablo in California, near San Francisco. It's 160 miles away. Yes, we're up a mountain. Yes, they're up a mountain. But you can see, again, a lot of the bottom of the mountains. You can, you can see the snow-capped tops, and then we can see the rest of the mountains as well. 160 miles away, this should be, should be behind 17,000 feet of curve. Again, yes, you might be able to see the top of it, but not all of the mountains. And here's the... The furthest one I've found so far, this is my record so far, I'm sure it'll keep on growing. This is the reunion island from the Isle of Mauritius. It's 149 miles away. It's a long, long, long way away. And once again, we can see the peak, but we can also see most of the rest down. This is quite clearly a very, very good observational day. Very clear, very calm. Um, the highest peak on reunion island is 3,072 meters tall. It's just under two miles. 149 miles away, everything should be behind 2.8 miles of curvature. Should have curved way, way away. And again, it's not just the tops we can see, we can see much more. We can see a lot more, you know, 2,000 feet or so of that. We can see far more. That's what I'm saying about the Z axis curve. It's not there. It's not there if you watch a boat out to sea and then get a telescope on it, it'll come back into view again. Yeah, it's perspective and it's obviously the limits of our, our, our eyesight, but it's also conditions as well, quite clearly. Yeah, heat, haze, condition, what have you. Visible conditions do check. But the point is that photographs have been taken. I've just shown you a dozen photographs from starting at 30 miles, 60 miles, 90 miles. Now we can, see, we can see 150 miles in the distance and it should well have disappeared behind the curve of the globe.
Huge flat places on Earth, everybody's aware. If you ever watch Top Gear, the Bonneville Salt Flats, where everybody goes racing. But there's even bigger ones in South America. Uh, is it uh, Ethiopia? Uh, but the Salad Salad uh, uh, in, in Bolivia, they've gone for it's four thousand square. They've gone for hundreds of thousands of square miles. Big flat places on Earth. Yeah, famously flatter than a pancake. <clears throat> the evidence is all around us. The Earth is flat, and that is that. Don't overthink this thing. It's not necessary. Primary knowledge or secondary knowledge? You're going to use your own senses, your own observances, your own experiments, hopefully, or you're going to believe what you've been told just because that's what everybody believes. It's not this overly covert, like, psyop. Like, what would be the point of that? To discredit the truth movement? If you look into Flat Earth for three hours, that you, you would realize that it's not a psyop. It's not a psyop. A psyop of that magnitude that would ultimately bring the truth movement to its... Do you really think the truth movement is going to be brought to its knees anytime soon, given all the information? The same is with Flat Earth. Think about it. So why? why, why what, what, what have they got to gain? You know, why bother? Well, as far as I'm concerned, if you've... Once you've done research, and, and if you come to the same conclusion that, that myself and thousands of others have done, it overthrows heliocentrism, it overthrows the Big Bang, it over, overthrows evolution, overthrows everything we, we thought we knew about the world. And I've heard people say that uh, the reason they don't want to publish uh, papers that disagree with special relativity or general relativity is that they built their careers on this. If you were paranoid, you'd say there's a conspiracy, whatever it is. Uh, there is a lot of resistance to getting something published that disagrees with either of Einstein's two theories. As for all of the photos and video evidence we now have that the Earth is round, well, all of that material is completely fabricated. A hoax perpetrated by space agencies, airlines, globe manufacturers. They are reaping the rewards of our ignorant belief that the Earth is actually round.
stupid rumor I started laughing That's a fact I knew for certain That I would disprove it It's true, a true story 